Dear viewer, dear viewer, I am currently fighting for my life on Callisto, both a moon of Jupiter and the setting for the next great sci-fi horror game, The Callisto Protocol, available now, sponsor of today's episode. I'm here, but what I want to know is how anything, anything living or just maybe alive, kinda with too many teeth, could ever call a place like this home? How could this frozen over hell ever be habitable? Well, let's begin. Let's begin. Sorry. You think they're trying to scare me for dramatic effect or something? We begin today with a probe's eye view. Callisto is one of the many moons of Jupiter, the third largest moon in the entire solar system. It's about the same size as planet Mercury. But unlike Mercury, Callisto doesn't really have an atmosphere. It's tidally locked with Jupiter, and it's the largest object in the solar system we think isn't fully differentiated yet, meaning that unlike other moons and planets, its constituents aren't fully physically and chemically separated. Callisto is also the oldest and most cratered surface in the system, with expansive pockmarked plains called Asgard and Valhalla, which, as you know me, a science Thor, makes me pretty happy. Let's take a closer look. At first glance, Callisto seems extraordinarily hostile to life. The ambient temperature outside is cold enough to liquefy nitrogen almost, and if you're a human and you like to breathe and not die, there's no real oxygen in the atmosphere. However, in the 90s, the so-called Galileo spacecraft probed something that was worth probing. It found that in response to the varying magnetic fields of Jupiter, Callisto wasn't acting like a big rock like other large moons and planets. No, it was acting like a perfectly conductive sphere with induced currents of its own that repelled Jupiter's currents. Now, this is extremely interesting because it suggests that there's something very conductive inside of Callisto. Perhaps an ocean of salty seawater, perhaps 10 kilometers deep? This is exciting because life on Earth likely began also in an ocean with bits of salt and other stuff floating in it. Today, Callisto is one of our top candidates in the search for extraterrestrial life. Oh, oh, please don't hurt me. Please. What? What was that? Oh, yeah, sure, let me, let me see if I have one. Uh, one sec. What, you just wanted a cough drop? Here, man, geez, take it, you sound terrible. A possible subsurface ocean on Callisto isn't the only place where life might be, though. Unlike other large Jovian moons, Callisto sits outside of Jupiter's large and dangerous radiation belts, where high energy particles are corralled by strong magnetic fields. Now, the ambient level of radiation on Callisto is much higher than on Earth, about 10 times higher, but with the proper protections, this could afford some limited amount of human habitation. In fact, a hundred years ago, all the way back in 2003, NASA had a study that outlined how robots and nuclear reactors could prepare this little moon for man. Dude, just keep, just keep eating the cough drops. You sound like you're trying to scare me. The first challenge to, I don't know, building a space prison or whatever on Callisto is getting there. The third largest moon in the solar system is hundreds of millions of kilometers away, so to get there in any reasonable amount of time, we're going to need advancements in rocket technology. Specifically, we're going to need some kind of nuclear propulsion. There just isn't anything else other than antimatter that maximizes thrust and minimizes the amount of fuel needed. With nuclear-powered rockets, NASA figured that a round trip to Callisto and back could be completed in as little as two years. Our first probes took six years just to get to Jupiter. The other advantage to advanced nuclear technology on board is that nuclear reactors can provide both power and heat. After you land, have a robot place a reactor maybe, I don't know, a thousand meters away from your habitat, build a shield out of all that ice that's already there, water is dense and therefore a good radiation shield, and bam, you have a small but livable station, hopefully not full of monsters. Of course, I'm making this all sound very easy. It wouldn't be. 
we still need multiple advances across multiple different scientific fields and technologies to make the habitation of Callisto come true. Advanced spacesuits, miniaturized nuclear reactors, autonomous robots that can go to Callisto before us and set up all the infrastructure that we need. Even back in 2003, NASA didn't think any of this would be possible until 2045, another 20 years from now. Even if we overcome all the technical challenges, it's not like you're going to be spending any significant amount of time on Callisto. It's going to be more like a way station for a few weeks, a few months, maybe a year. It's low gravity, high radiation, hard work. But if through our perseverance, our science, our technology, we could overcome all of these obstacles, oh, the science that we could do. We could map surfaces with our own hands. We could collect samples, bring them back to Earth. And most excitingly, we could teleoperate tiny little subsurface submarines to look for alien life in a possible subsurface salty ocean. <gasps> If we found extraterrestrial life on Callisto, it would be the most important thing to ever happen in human history. But if that amazing day did come, and it wasn't like weird mutated pus people, the challenges on Callisto would continue. I'm getting to you, Todd. I'm just about to talk to you. Don't you dare get on camera. You look terrible. Like, you look like a bagpipe with mouths. On July 24th, 1969, then-President Dick Nix had a conversation with the first humans to ever walk on another world. But he had to do so across quarantine. The non-zero chance that the astronauts had brought something back with them, infection or organism, meant that they didn't actually return to normal life for another three weeks after they landed. This was one of the most vivid examples of what is now called planetary protection, a practice codified in the Outer Space Treaty. It holds all spacefaring entities to ensuring no forwards contamination, bringing earthly stuff that isn't contained to another world, or backwards contamination, bringing any alien stuff home that isn't controlled and contained. Why? Well, any life form from another planet will necessarily have a totally different evolutionary history and could therefore be catastrophically unprepared for one another. Think of it like the prime directive, but for the health of everything involved. I mean, who knows? Microbes that we accidentally bring back from Mars could start the next global pandemic, or stuff living on your butt crack could wipe out all the life in Enceladus's oceans. It's a possibility. You're a dirty boy. <laughs> this is why planetary protection is a thing that we have to do. And so, Aria, activate the Callisto Protocol. Do you even know what that means? I mean, no, that would be a spoiler if I just told them. Just ready the ship, please. Did you disinfect your hair? No, I didn't disinfect my hair yet. Aria, I'll do it on the way. God. Did I disinfect my hair? Come on, like I'd let anybody get a hold of my precious organisms. <laughs> it's much more likely that something on Callisto was gonna infect me and turn me into like, I don't know, a big goo boy with too many mouths. <laughs> That'd be an interesting thing to put in a video game. Because of its extremely hostile surface environment, Callisto falls into planetary protection category two, meaning that we don't actually think we need to sterilize our spacecraft before we land there because it's very unlikely anything lives on the icy cratered surface. And so, with the right advancements in technologies, with the right protections, it is plausible that one day humans will step foot on the surface of Callisto and do science for some appreciable amount of time. Whether it becomes a way station for further exploration of the Jovian system or a space prison with that guy from Transformers. As for what may be lurking in the maybe ocean beneath my maybe feet, well, we'll just have to actually go there to find out. Until next time. No, no I know I'm already here, but I'm not going down there. That's spooky, dude. Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the Callisto Protocol for sponsoring today's episode. It's available across all major platforms right now. Get out there and try to scream in space. You can't. 
Also, thank you so much to the Very Nerdy staff here at the facility for their direct and substantial support in the creation of each and every video. If you want to join us here at the facility, if you want to drape on a silky white lab coat, see videos early, join a private Discord, get private monthly members-only live streams with me, <laughs> go to patreon.com slash kylehill and join the facility today. If you support us just enough, get your name on Aria here in every single video that we do. <laughs> Look, there's already hundreds and hundreds of you. How am I even going to pass this? So it's not just all the surface conditions that keep us off Callisto, like radiation and the temperature and the air. Those are all big problems, but it's also the gravity. Callisto only has about one eighth the gravity of Earth, and we know that human bodies change substantially in reduced gravity. So even if there is some kind of limit for the radiation or the food or the water, you still don't want to spend more than a couple of months or like a year on the surface of a planet with such low gravity. Your spine extends and your face gets all bloaty and your heart starts pumping all weird. And that's before you meet the monsters. Thanks for watching.